Well, hello, Stevens Creek Church, and happy Mother's Day. I can't think of a better day to be here. Thank you, Pastor Marty and Patty, for inviting me. This has truly been an honor. We absolutely love our church. And Marty's right, this is my service, our service that we normally go to. So yay noon, right? You can sleep in a little. We, we sometimes do chores, right, boys? They're not really fa- fans of it, but we sometimes do chores before we go to church. So Yes, we love the noon. And I'm so glad to be here with you all. I hope you give your mom an extra hug today. I was telling last service that teenagers don't necessarily love hugging their mom. Some do, some don't. And so like on Mother's Day, I'm like, dude, you have to give me like a full on hug where I feel the full contact, right? Not a bounce hug as some like to refer to it as. I'm like, I need full contact. It's Mother's Day, I get this, right? And I'm I'm happy to say they honored that. So I'm feeling the love today from my own. Let me show you a picture of my five guys, as I like to refer to them as. So they're my four boys and my awesome husband, Dave. And I call them my five guys. And we also do happen to love five guys, burgers and fries. So it works, right? (laughs) All right, well, to start out the service, I wanted to share a story with you that I felt like captured what many of us mothers go through. Because as we know, motherhood is a journey, parenthood is a journey. And I saw a meme recently that I just laughed out loud at because I'm like, we've lived this. And so here's the meme, it's about silence. Let's go on to the the next one, there we go. All right, it says, silence is golden. Unless you have a toddler, then silence is just suspicious, right? You're laughing because you know, you know this. Like we crave silence. But then we kind of don't because we know that means somebody's getting into something they're not supposed to. Well, years ago when our youngest Chatham was only about, I don't know, a year and a half, he was walking really good and he could play, you know, by himself with like his little, the big mega block Legos, you know, kind of on the floor. We decided, okay, we got Saddam set up. The other boys are doing their thing. It's a little loud normally, but not crazy loud. And Dave and I on a Saturday morning were like, hey, let's like go put away some laundry, you know, romantic things like that when your kids are doing what they need to be doing. Okay, so we were putting away laundry and we were literally steps away from Chatham because our master bedroom was right off of our family room. And all of a sudden we realize it's really, really suspiciously quiet. And for like 10 seconds, we loved it and we relished it. And we were like, is this what life is like when the kids aren't in the house? Like, or or when they're calm or something? Like it had been something we hadn't experienced in a while. But then very quickly, we, we kind of panicked because we were like, wait a minute, this is so weird, this is suspicious. What's going on with Chatham? So we raced to the room. Again, we were only like steps away and he's not there. So of course we're really panicking now. And then I look at the front door and I think Dave went out the front door and he's like, Chatham, Chatham, we can't see him anywhere. And we're like, okay, I don't think he went out there. So then we ask his brothers, we're like, have you seen Chatham? Where's Chatham, where's Chatham? And they're all concerned and they're like, I don't know, I don't know, I thought he was right here. And all of a sudden, we all looked towards our kitchen, which was right off of the family room. And it was dark because we had made breakfast, we turned off the light, but then we could see this little light coming from the half bath that was attached to our kitchen. And so we we race over there and to our relief, we see little Chatham in there standing up with a big grin on his face. But you know how as a parent, You kind of start up and then you start looking down, right? You're examining the situation. So my relief is there and I see his precious little hair and his precious little face. And then I'm like, okay, why is there black around his mouth? Because he's grinning and he's got like black stuff in his teeth and all around his mouth. And I'm like, that's weird. We didn't make anything black this morning for breakfast. So I keep on searching and I look down at his hand and there is a sopping wet Oreo, like stuff coming off of it with several bites out of it, like nasty disintegrating in his hand. And then he goes to dip it in the toilet and proceeds to try to eat it. You guys, he had had several bites of this thing. So Dave and I, of course, are like holding back just gag reflexes. And so Dave goes and gets him. I'm like, we gotta get him. We gotta get this out of his mouth. And we're going over to the sink and I'm like, gag him, gag him, get it out. Because there's another truth about raising boys and maybe girls do this too, I don't know. But in our house, the boys rarely flush a toilet if I'm being honest. So I'm pretty sure there was probably something in there. I'm sorry, I know it's a little much for church, but I'm just being real. So I didn't look, I didn't want the confirmation, but I assumed it was in there and I was like, you know what? We cleaned him up real good. And I'm like, you know what, it's antibodies. We're just like building antibodies. That's what I tell myself, right? And so (laughs) Chatham's just fine. He's six years old now, we all survive, but you know, in motherhood and parenthood and just in life in general, 
We have so many moments that are just heart racing moments. We have peaceful moments. We have moments of joy and moments just of dread and moments where our hearts break. And you know, this message that I'm gonna share today is a message about peace and it's definitely gonna be for moms, but it's really for each and every one of us in this room because all of us are coming off one crazy year. None of us saw it coming. We're still in the midst of it. And many of us are reeling from everything that's happening and kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I feel like as human beings and really in the world that we live in, we often feel like we can only have peace when everything is just so, so, and the conditions are perfect. But the more that I've read scripture, the more I see that peace really has nothing to do with our circumstances. And so today with the time I have left, I'm gonna talk about what is peace when it comes to God? Because God actually created peace and it's actually a gift from God, but how do we as Christ followers experience it? I wanna share one of my favorite verses with you to start off, and that is this. It says, a heart at peace gives life to the body, and that's Proverbs 14, 30. And I love that because whenever we feel like we're at peace, don't we have more energy? Don't we have more clarity in our mind? Don't we feel like we wanna do all the things? We're like, oh, I'm feeling so peaceful. Let's go like solve every problem, right? And we just, we, we feel good. But when we don't feel peace, we're foggy in our mind, we don't have the energy to barely get out of bed, and our attitude isn't really that great, and it's hard to even put a smile on our face. We feel defeated, and we feel depleted. But again, God's peace isn't based on our circumstances. Here's my first point. Peace is not the absence of chaos. It is the presence of of our creator. And I love this verse from John 14, 27, and this is straight from Jesus. It says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And I love that because Jesus, as one who walked as a human being on this earth, understood that we as human beings, we get freaked out, right? So he's in essence saying, hey, don't freak out, chill. This world's crazy, I'll own, it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll own that with you, it's crazy. There's some crazy stuff that happens here, but you don't have to go through it alone. He's like, you have me, and I give you peace. He's the prince of peace. He's the good shepherd, he's the one we can count on. And you know, the more I've, I've been studying peace, and it's been years that I've studied peace because I've always been fascinated with it and I want it so much and I know that I'm not alone in that. I think every human being on this earth desires peace and I believe too and I see in scripture we were made to experience it. And so as I've studied the word peace, I wanted to go back to the original text and that would have been in Hebrew. And whenever the Bible scholars are interpreting and making our English versions, they're looking at the Hebrew words and then trying to decide what the best English word would be. But often when it comes to Hebrew words, there's not just one English word that can capture it. And when it comes to the Hebrew word for peace, shalom, that's the case. It actually has a deeper meaning than even the word peace. When you look it up, it actually also means wholeness or not lacking anything. And I love that because when I think about those times when I'm not feeling peace, I don't feel whole. I feel like I'm lacking. I feel like I'm depleted. And I feel like I'm defeated. But when I experience God's peace, I feel wholeness. And I feel his presence. Because again, it's about his presence and not my circumstances. And so you can actually, just a fun little exercise you might wanna do if you love peace as much as I do. Um, you can look up any verse about peace and you can replace the word peace with the word wholeness in any verse about peace and it will give you a whole new meaning about peace. So I, I challenge you to do that. And I wanted to not only know what the Hebrew word for peace was and understand its meanings, but I also wanted to go a little deeper and find out, okay, I know that peace in Hebrew is shalom, and it's actually how, in Israel, how they greet each other till this day. They actually say shalom instead of just hello, which is essentially saying, hey friend, have peace. And I, I love that, I think we should do that. But shalom, actually, I wanted to see what it looked like in its earliest written form. And I discovered these ancient Hebrew word pictures, which are actually what the current written form of Hebrew is based on today. And so I wanna share with you what the word shalom looked like when those ancient Hebrews would write it to each other. And it looks like this. 
So up at the top, it's these four different symbols. Now back then they would have read right to left, not left to right like we read our English language. So we're gonna go through each symbol and then I'll talk about the greater meaning. So the first symbol, the one on the right is teeth, that's animal teeth, and it stands for breaking. The second symbol is a shepherd's staff, and it's pointed down as if a shepherd was bringing in his lost sheep, okay? Putting that around the sheep's neck. Now the third is a tent peg, and that stands for attached to or established by. And then the fourth, that looks pretty easy to, to see what that is, that's like choppy waters, and it stands for chaos. So when it comes to shalom, how the ancient Hebrews would write the word shalom or peace to each other, God defined peace like this. When you put it all together, it's breaking the authority attached to chaos. And I love that. Let me say it again. Breaking the authority attached to chaos. So in essence, it's saying peace has nothing to do with our circumstances. That's not at all how God defines peace. What he is saying here, he's saying that peace, God's peace, is it has everything to do with what and who we give authority to in our life. So it could be something that started out good and ended up, we ended up giving authority to it and then it was no longer good for us because the only authority that we really have over our life, that we should have over our life is God and his word and what he has to say because he is the good shepherd and he does not lead us astray. But I think sometimes there's relationships, there's habits that can, you know, not always bad habits. They could be outright sins, but they could also be good things that aren't supposed to have authority over our life. Those things, when they're in the wrong standing in our life, they can really suck the life out of us. They can steal from us. They can deplete us. And as I was studying the word shalom, I found another word right next to it in the dictionary of the ancient Hebrew language. And I thought this was very interesting. And it's this word, shalal. You'll notice that it's using some of the same ancient Hebrew word pictures, but it has a greatly different meaning. That first picture there on the right is breaking. So again, it's those animal teeth. It stands for breaking or destructive. And then you have two shepherd staffs, which again, they're down, meaning authority. And so in essence, it's destructive authority or to spoil, rob, or prey and to seize authority via destructive means. When I learned this, it's like a light bulb went off for me. And I thought, hmm, what does shalal sound like? To me, it sounds like the thief that Jesus talks about. Our enemy, Satan, who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. In John 10:10, 10, 10, it says this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Another translation says they may have life and have it abundantly. And I think that that just paints the picture. You know, God's authority is a loving authority, a caring authority, whereas the enemy tries to take authority via destructive means by making us doubt ourselves, doubt God, feel less than, be distracted, be defeated, be depleted. And you know, there was an experience I had recently that demonstrate, demonstrated shalal in, in our lives more than any other thing I've seen, and I wanted to share it with you today. So recently, Dave and I had the opportunity to go to Costa Rica, which was one of our bucket list things. Tickets are super cheap right now. That's one perk of COVID. And so we, we really were like, let's do this. And so we love to go hiking. And in Costa Rica, it's one of the most biodiverse places on planet Earth. There's so many trees and animals and birds that you can only find in Costa Rica. And so it was one of our bucket list places. We decided to do it, only went for a few days, but it was so worth it. And one of my favorite times we had was when we were hiking in the Rincon de la Vieja National Forest. And I would describe it like this. It's like you take a tropical rainforest and you smash it together with Yellowstone National Park. So in essence, it's like a volcanic rainforest. So you're gonna see like all this, these lush trees and there's literally spider, monkey, spider monkeys going above the canopy. And let me tell you, I've always joked and said my kids are like spider monkeys and it's oddly accurate, okay? It is oddly accurate. The whole time I was like, I was right. It's crazy how they play with each other. Anyway, they're pretty fun. So there's spider monkeys, all these birds, beautiful trees, beautiful flowers. Then there's like hot springs going and hot pots going like you'd see in Yellowstone. It's magical. We went on a four hour hike and our guide was super well versed in all the different things going on in the forest. And I kept on noticing this one tree on the hike that just 
it just, it took my breath away because it was beautiful, but it was also super interesting and I, I wanted to know more about it. And it was this tree right here. Now, my picture that I took doesn't do it justice, but it's super wide and it had this very, very wide base and all these little like, you know, roots kind of going together. And then it was super tall and all these trees would make a big canopy over the trail. And so I asked the guide, I said, listen, I have seen so many of these trees and they're just, they're unlike anything I've seen in the U.S. And I've gone on a lot of hikes in the U.S., but I've never seen a tree quite like this. And he said, oh, I'm glad you asked about that tree. He said, that tree's kind of a freak of nature. And I was like, really? Well, tell me more, you know. And he said, well, it's actually a symbiotic tree. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, well, it actually is what we call the strangler tree or strangler fig. And he said, in the science community, we describe this tree as giving a host tree what they like to refer to as an unwanted hug. So essentially, I'm serious, you guys. It's, nature is awesome. It's so awesome. So this tree grows a root close to another host tree, and it's like, hey there, friend. Let's be buddy-buddy, okay? And then it's like, hey, can I borrow some of your water? And it brings another root around. It's like, hey, can I borrow some of your sunlight? You know, I just need a little bit. It starts wrapping itself around the host tree. And then it's like, hey, and I need some of your nutrients. Let me just have a little bit of that. And little by little, it wraps more and more and more around the host tree to the, where it makes literally like a fortress around the tree. And by the time it completes the fortress around the tree, the host tree is completely a shell of a tree, depleted of its light, depleted of its water, depleted of its nutrients. And the strangler tree lives on. Pretty savage, right? But you know what? As I looked at this tree, I not only thought it was like really cool because nature's crazy, but I thought, I feel like God gives us so many lessons through how he created nature. And to me, what I thought is I've never seen a better example of shalal than the strangler tree. It's literally taking authority by destructive means. It's literally sucking the life out of an otherwise healthy tree that had no idea this was gonna be something bad for it. It thought it was just getting a friend, a little hug. And it takes over. But you guys, we're not that different than that host tree. There are things in our life that come along and, and sometimes it is a sin thing, like we, we end up going into sin, but a lot of times it's something that is otherwise good that becomes too much and it takes more and more and more authority in our life. And before you know it, it's depleting us of all the nutrients we need from the Lord and it's taking authority over our life. And God doesn't want us to be ruled by the strangler trees of our life. He doesn't want us to be ruled by our addiction. He doesn't want us to be ruled by our mental illness. He doesn't want us to be ruled by our shame or whatever happened to us or the fear that we have that something bad's gonna happen or the relationship that started out good that's become codependent and really toxic. He doesn't want any of those things to have authority over our life. Only God himself is our authority. Only he gives us light to the path that he wants for us. But we have to take a self-assessment and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what the strangler trees are in our life, or we're just gonna keep on living in the shadow of that, feeling less and less and less. And so I hope if there's anything you take from this message today, I hope you walk away really thinking and praying about, maybe even talking to your loved ones about, hey, what are those strangler trees in our life? Do we have any? Maybe you don't. And, and it could be a personal strangler tree. It could be a family strangler tree. Like there's something as a family that's off that's just sucking the life out of you. Or it could be a personal battle that maybe you've never brought to light because you're ashamed. You know, that was me. I was going through anxiety and depression. It started off as postpartum depression, which I wanna shine a light on real quick because so many, I mean, it's Mother's Day. I think we need to talk about it. So many moms deal with this. And when you're pregnant and excited, People don't wanna tell you about it, but it's very common. And I was one of the many that experienced that and then it lingered on for four years and it went from postpartum depression to clinical depression to also clinical anxiety and I had debilitating anxiety attacks. And at first I was so scared to even talk about it. I felt ashamed. I felt like I'd done something wrong. I felt like I wasn't being a good Christian, a good mom, a good wife. I just thought, how dare I feel this way? But when I finally brought it to the light, you know, it was like a strangler tree around me. It was sucking the life out of me. But when I finally just was like, Lord, please, please help me. I surrender this to you. I surrender my mind to you. I sur surrender my de debilitating thoughts to you, my toiling to you, Lord, please give me peace. Do you know, 
every time I went to him, and it was so much. I, I, I mean, he was everything I needed every day of my life to get through that battle. He didn't necessarily take it away right then and there, and he has the power to do that. But most often, more often than not, he doesn't do that. But he will bring you peace in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your struggle, and he will bring you closer to him and you will learn things that you couldn't learn any other way when you're in the struggle. And little by little, he's destroying that strangler tree in your life. And that's what God did for me. And you know, for you, you in this room, I know there's many in this room who are going through anxiety and depression or any other mental illness right now. Maybe yours has lingered on even longer. But I'm speaking openly about this because I wanna tell you it's a multi-pronged approach to, to getting help. It means going to your doctor. It means possibly getting on medication, even if it's short-term or long-term. It means taking the shame off of it and getting the help that you need from a Christian counselor. It means talking about it with your close family and friends and being real about the struggle and not letting the strangler tree of mental illness rule your life anymore. Because it is one of those things in our culture that tries to say it's the authority over our life, but it doesn't define your life. It doesn't define you as a person. It doesn't mean you failed. And so if that is your strangler tree, I just pray that today is the day where you're honest about it with God. For some, I mean, bring it to God, because I think sometimes we even, even though God knows we're going through it, we hold it back and we think, oh, nobody can know. But really, he already knows. Bring it to him and get the help that you need. As we move on, I'm gonna talk about how we actually have peace in our life. Next point is this. Peace is a gift of the Holy Spirit that we must pursue, promote, and protect in our heart and home. And I love this verse in Philippians, which actually goes along with the battle of mental illness, and that's Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God, which exceeds all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. So here's my next point. We must pursue peace, or we pursue peace, when we fully surrender our heart and mind to him. You'll see in the word whenever it talks about peace, it often mentions heart and mind, heart and mind. You see that over and over again through scripture, and I love that because, you know, it means it starts in our thoughts and then our feelings follow. And it's also in essence saying we have more control over our thoughts, over what stays, than we really think we do. And so we have to allow God, you know, we take those thoughts captive and allow God to renew our mind with the truth of his word. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. So here's the point, we promote peace when we are kind and encouraging and work to establish healthy boundaries. I wanna talk about this really quickly. We promote peace by being peacemakers, by being kind, by being encouraging. I think that's an easy thing for us to understand, but I think sometimes this can go a little sideways when we feel like God calls us to be a peacemaker to the point of being a doormat. Because where this becomes really hard is when we're pursuing peace with somebody, but they're not being a peacemaker back at us, like they're not taking it. They're being passive aggressive, they're being negative, or they're, they're asking us to prove ourselves over and over again. You guys, that's not love, okay? And sometimes we have to put these healthy boundaries in place to someone we love very much. And that's, that's in a way that we promote peace with them is, is actually saying like, listen, I love you and I'm trying to have peace with you, but you saying these hateful things about me or my family, whoever it is, you're not promoting peace to me. And so until you can talk to me in a respectful way, I'm gonna have to put a little distance there and I don't wanna walk away from this conversation, but I don't want you to continue saying things that you're gonna regret later and I certainly don't wanna say things that I'm gonna regret later. It takes us putting those healthy boundaries in place, giving a little space in love. And that can be really hard, but, but we need to do it. And then lastly, we protect the peace in our heart and home by choosing to trust God, especially in the hard seasons. You know, the greatest way we can have peace in times of trouble is trusting the Lord. But that's when it's the hardest time to trust the Lord. And I wanna share a story with you that, man, it's a story that has, has changed my life in a lot of ways because I've been so influenced by how this family handled a nightmare in their life. But it also showed me 
you know, how to trust God and have peace in the most trying times. And I wanna tell you the story about my friend, Katie Ann. She's a childhood friend of mine. We used to cheer together and she was one of those girls that everybody loved. She's like the Pied Piper of the group, has this huge smile and is so kind and loving to everybody. And so everybody loved Katie and still does till this day. And you know, we've been in Georgia for a long time. We've moved several times. So I haven't seen Katie in many years, but we've kept in touch through Facebook. And I remember tragically one day, her sharing some news that absolutely no parent wants to share. And my heart sank and everybody who read this post, their heart sank. She said that after a series of tests, a doctor came into their room and told them the unthinkable. The doctor came to them and said, I am so sorry, but your two-year-old has a cancerous brain tumor and we are immediately going to have to do treatment. And not only was this just a hard news and the most horrific news I think that any parent can hear in that moment, but Katie Ann and Billy had also just had a baby two weeks prior. So they're in this doctor's office with a two week old and then their two year old who they thought was just sickly, you know, just having a cold and then told that she has brain cancer. And so they did what any parent would do. It was go time. It was get the treatments, go search out everything about this. We're gonna attack this, we're gonna fight it. They're praying like they never prayed before. They're gathering all the prayer warriors. And over those two years, they fought so hard, treatment after treatment, stays in the Ronald McDonald house. And they tried everything and it looked good for a while and then it wouldn't until one day the doctor came to them and said, listen, we've literally done everything we know how to do. We've even thought outside of the box and I'm so sad to say there's nothing more we can do. And I remember seeing this post from Katie Ann and I thought, man, I mean, I, I just can't even Imagine the disappointment. I mean, that's even an understatement. All the prayers prayed, all the treatments, all this stuff, watching your child grow more frail by the day. And then this, you know, but she said they prayed about it, her and her husband, Billy. And they said, he said, you can either try other things that I know aren't gonna work or you can go home with her. And so they said, we're gonna take our baby girl home. We wanna be in our home. We want her to be with her sister. And if these are her last days, we wanna be together as a family in our house. And so for those days, they, they lived it up. I mean, they were sopping the joy up out of everything. They were singing songs and, you know, Bennett was sickly, but they would do whatever they could within their house just to find joy and to create joyful moments and memories as a family. And she would even share videos of them singing worship songs and funny songs. And it was just a precious time for their family until one day, on October 26th, and I remember it because it's actually Dave's birthday, we were out walking and um, I got a ding from the Caring Bridge site that I had been a member of, that Katie Ann had a new post. And she said, I'm so sorry to say this, but Bennett, that's the little girl's name, she's passed away. And she described the nightmare of what it was and the heartbreaking moment that it was, but she also said that there was this supernatural peace that surpassed understanding in that room. And in the months that followed, about six months later, Billy and Katie decided that they needed to move away from the house where Bennett passed away, which is totally understandable. And they were rolling up a rug in the process of the move. And as they got to rolling up the middle part of the rug, this little puzzle piece fell out and it fell out upside down. And Katie Ann said it was kind of a weird moment because she said, no one in their family likes puzzles. Like, they give away puzzles if somebody gives it to them. You know, they don't like it, they don't have the patience for it. And she said, so it was just so weird that this would be here because she said this was a brand new rug that we bought, you know, a few years ago when we got the house and the kids never played with puzzles. So she goes down to pick it up thinking she's just gonna throw it away. And when she picks it up, her heart stops because she found something really special on that puzzle piece. You see, in those days when they were at home with Bennett, she explained to Bennett about how tragically, for any parent to do this, that, that Bennett would most likely go to heaven before they would. You know, like any parent, you wanna prepare your kids for what's to come. And she explained how heaven wasn't a place with machines and heaven wasn't a place with needles and in heaven there was no cancer and there were no hospitals and everybody was joyful and you could run and play and have energy. But she said, but Bennett, the most wonderful part of heaven is being with Jesus. You're gonna have Jesus. And Bennett would smile. And then she said, Bennett asked her, mommy, will there be flowers in heaven? 
And Katie Ann, without a blink, said, yes, there'll be flowers in heaven, Bennett. More flowers than you've ever seen in your life because God created flowers. And I bet you there's flowers in heaven that were never even on earth, just the most beautiful flowers. And she said, Bennett got so excited and she smiled really big and she said, well, mommy, I wanna send you flowers when I'm in heaven. I wanna send you flowers from heaven. So fast forward those six months, Katie Ann picks up that puzzle piece and looks at it. And do you know what was on that puzzle piece? One single flower, not attached to anything else, just a little daisy. She said, it didn't make sense. Like, where would this even go in a puzzle? And she said, she just looked up to heaven and was like, thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Bennett. Thank you for sending me flowers from heaven. You see, Katie Ann also explained as she told this story that it's, it's just so fitting that this flower came on a puzzle piece because when everything feels like it's falling apart in our life, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like God has just given us these puzzle pieces that don't really make sense, that don't really attach to the other. But we have to trust in those moments that God does see it all. God knows how it all fits together. And on this side of heaven, we can't explain childhood cancer. We can't explain the loss that we feel. We can't explain wayward children. We can't explain the disappointments in our life. But what we can do and what God calls us to do is to trust Him. And Katie Ann and her husband Billy understood this really important point that we all need to understand, and it's this. When we trust God with the pieces, that's where peace is. When we trust God with the pieces, that's where we find his peace. The more we trust, the more peace we have. And God wants us to have his peace even when the bottom drops out, especially when the bottom drops out, especially when we're experiencing the hardest part of our life. Because that chaos in our life, that hard part of our life, it doesn't have to have authority over our life. And when we surrender it to the Lord, and when we trust God with it, He brings us His peace and says, child, I am with you, and I am for you. I'm giving you flowers from heaven. I wanna leave you with one last image for the moms in the room, and it's this. As I was researching the ancient Hebrew word pictures, I found this image, and I wasn't even looking for it, but I just thought, this is so cool, this is so fitting, and it's this image right here. This is how the ancient Hebrews would write the word mother to each other or im. And it, it, it has an ox head, if you're looking, you know, on the right side, which stands for strong and tender. And then you know that symbol that's to the left here. It's water again, which stands for chaos. So how fitting that the word mother and how they would write the word mother way back when in ancient Hebrew world, they would say the term mother to each other and write it this way and mean, hey there, strong and tender. Mama in the midst of chaos, which I think like, man, they really knew something. And do you know too, the ox was often used as a sacrificial animal to make atonement. And you guys as moms, gosh, don't we sacrifice so much? These Hebrews were really smart. And I wanna leave you with this image because I want you to know moms, you're strong and tender in the midst of the chaos because God is with you. He made you for this. And he never forsakes you, he never leaves you. He's always with you through all the hard times and all the good times. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for all the people in this room, Lord. I wanna pray a special blessing over all the mothers in the room and all those who mother, Lord. Even if they don't have kids, you call them mom. There's so many that are mothers to all those around them. And I just celebrate all the moms in this room. I just, I pray that everybody is extra nice to them, Lord, and that the kids are extra well behaved today. We're all hoping. And I also wanna pray for all those in this room that feel like they're in the midst of a strangler tree. They feel like their life is being defeated and depleted. They feel like something is sucking the life out of them. I pray that you give them the courage to call it out, Lord, to bring it to the light and to say, bring down this fortress, Lord, break the stronghold that this addiction, this thing in my life, this family member even, this relationship that may be toxic or anything else that's out of balance, Lord, that it does not have authority in my life. But you, Lord, you are the good shepherd. You are the one who leads my life, Lord. And Lord, we are praying for that. And we are also thanking you in advance of the great work you are doing in all of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.